this point. You're in London. Where else? It's like an abandoned library or book repository, something like that, right? Because what has happened to the Underwood's home? Destroyed. It's destroyed. So Nathaniel is now what? Homeless? What else? Masterless. Masterless. Okay. What else? Hunted. Why? The asylum all will know that he's still alive. Yeah, because they're not going to find they're not going to find his body. Okay, so three twenty four, three twenty five. They, you know, he asks, "How did you get away?" And he says, "Loveless himself kind of um got me out, sent for Quarrel and Jabor, etc." He wanted the amulet, and Nathaniel finally gets around to asking, "So, so what's so important about this amulet? Well, why?" And he says, it's long, Bartimaeus says, bottom of 325, it has long had a reputation for being an item of great power. The shaman who made it was a potent magician, indeed, far greater than any of your piffling crowd. And remember, he did it thousands of years ago. Okay? His or her tribe had no books or parchments. Their knowledge was passed down by word of mouth and memory alone. Anyway, it protects its wear from magical attack. That's it. You're wearing the amulet, you get hit by a magical attack, that is, a magician as a demon do something to you, and what does it do? Just absorbs it, you know. What is it in the Marvel Universe that absorbs, is it vibranium? Okay. So, it only works protectively, that is, you can't use this for an offensive weapon. So they keep talking, and Bartimaeus says, one of my informants stated that the amulet is rumored to contain an entity from the heart of the other place. Notice, other place is capitalized. We haven't heard much about the other place. Where or what is it? It's where the spirits exist, okay? Notice, it comes from the heart. Bartimaeus is kind of implying there, you know, if they think of the other places being like this, and this is the heart, the further out from the heart you get, what kind of spirits do you have? Weaker. Weaker. So like that. The closer to the heart, the more powerful the spirits. So like imps are out here. Ginny are, you know, here. Marids are over here. Afrits are, Afrits are, etc. So, he goes on, whatever the amulet's exact capacity, it's clear Lovelace is going to use it in the next few days at that conference he arranged. How? Hmm, I don't know. He's seizing power. That old story. Why that old story? Where humans are concerned is kind of a recurring theme. All humans? Magicians. Where magicians are concerned, okay? Nathaniel, he's a renegade, a traitor. He's a normal magician. You're just the same. Okay, give you a few years and you'll be just the same, okay? So Bartimaeus says, what do you propose to do? Now, what has he already proposed to Nathaniel that Nathaniel should do? Yeah, flee. Run away, fight again another day. Okay? So. Daniel says, I need to attend that conference. You know, who, who, who's attended to the, who are attendees of this conference? It's like Trump last night, last night, Devin, I don't know what it was, had his first, you know, state dinner. Okay? The president of France, prime minister, one of the two, of France and his wife were over. So he threw a state dinner. Who gets invited to those? Only the very top. Okay? Who's going to be invited to this conference, which is being thrown by Loveless? Is a 
12-year-old magician going to be invited? No. All right. So they read about where it is, Heddleton Hall, Amanda Cathcart, blah, 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 blah. So Nathaniel figures out where this is by using the scrying glass. In 3.30, Bartimaeus says, huh. Most magicians use their glasses to spy on people they fancy in the shower. That it's not that they fancy them in the shower. They spy on them when they're in the shower. Okay? No, not you. That would be too many, too easy. No. I've never approached a place that's so well guarded. This is the imp saying this. That hall is almost as bad as the tower itself. Hair trigger, nexuses, etc. So the imp saying, you know, you send me off, and this thing has a spider web of defenses around it. Bartimaeus, well, we don't know where the hall is. We don't know how to get in it. So, we're told. He sends Bartimaeus off, page 333. He felt powerless. Right? And to be a magician and to be powerless is to feel useless. It's to be nothing. In every crisis, from Lovelace's first attack the year before to the murder of Mrs. Underwood, Nathaniel had been unable to respond. His weakness had cost him dearly every time. Why is this important? If weakness makes you unable to do something, what eventually you're going to, are you going to decide? Yeah, don't be weak. Get as much power as you can, all right? So Nathaniel doesn't take Bartimaeus' advice. He goes off to get a newspaper, and when he does, he's attacked. Who's he attacked by? <coughs> Group of kids, okay? We hear some of their names. Stanley. <coughs> Kitty, girl, who becomes very important in the next two books, especially in the third book. Okay, These are the same kids who do what to Bartimaeus earlier in the novel? Well, try to. What's peculiar about these kids, this gang? Magic doesn't work on them. What doesn't work on them? Magic doesn't work on them. What else? They sense the end of the sailor gang, even though... Do they just sense it? Kitty can see it. Okay. Now, not much is done with that in this book. That becomes really important for the next two books. All right. So they take the scrying glass. Nathaniel fights them for it, and we're told. Page 342. In the instant Nathaniel was allowed, he only caught... A glimpse, but it imprinted itself indelibly upon his mind. A girl's face, pale, young, straight, dark hair. Eyes are wide, startled, not scared. Scared. Scared, fierce. Scared, fierce, too. He heard a cry of command, saw Fred lunge forward, glimpsed something pale and shiny, shoot toward him out of the darkness. Nathaniel ducked frantically, cracked the head of, side of his head against the building, and passed out. Okay? So... Fred offers to cut his throat. Kitty's like, nah, he's just a kid. Leave him alone. Okay. <coughs> Nathaniel goes back, tells Bartimaeus what happened. Bartimaeus like, um, can you describe them? Huh, 346. Same bunch who jumped me. Says, you know, they must be part of the resistance. And he says, interestingly, it sounded like opposition to the magicians was more developed and potentially formidable than I thought. Times were moving on in London. In other words, he's getting at an idea that's going to be addressed a little bit later and then more fully in the other books, that there is a cyclical history. Magicians get power. They stay on top. Resistance rises from the commoners. They overthrow the magicians. Magicians come back to power, and it keeps going on. Okay. 
So, Bartimaeus tells him about the defenses there are. And we're told, 349, Bartimaeus is thinking. The kid, where did he rate in my list of all-time human lows? That is, bottom of the bucket. He wasn't the worst master I had endured. But he presented some peculiar problems of his own. Why? All sensible magicians, well-versed in clever cruelty, know when the time is right to fight. What's the corollary to that? If they know when the time is right to fight, what else do they know? It's where to pitch your battle. <coughs> Are you going to go out, go all out for something small and insignificant? No. You wait. Okay? They risk themselves and their servants comparatively rarely. But the kid hadn't a clue. Part of the problem is he's only 12. He had been overwhelmed by a disaster brought about by his own meddling. His reaction was to lunge back at an enemy like a wounded snake. Whatever his original grudge, his previous discretion, had now been replaced by desperation powered by grief. Okay. Grief. In the Harry Potter novels, we're told grief is really what? It's love. Okay. Simple things like self-preservation were disregarded in his pride and fury. Well, what was his original intent for getting back at <coughs> Loveless? Why did he want to get back at him? He was humiliated. He damaged Nathaniel's pride. Now, Bartimaeus says, he's going to his death. Notice, there's no, he might be going to his death. He could get injured. It's, he's going to die. Which would have been fine, but he's taking me along. Why is he taking, why does Bartimaeus say, but he's taking me along? Well, there's still a little choky at the bottom of the Thames River. Right? And if Nathaniel doesn't live, that's where Bartimaeus goes to. So, they make their way and... Let's see here. They're trying to figure out how they're going to get in the, the hall. They still don't have a plan for getting from being outside the building to inside the building. So they follow the road. And page 353. Now, they're not in London. So they're outside... All the buildings, and Nathaniel sees, seemingly for the first time in his life, wide open green space. The boy was looking quite pale. Bottom of 353. The boy was looking quite pale and unsettled. It, it, it's nothing, because Bartimaeus asked him, now what's the matter? I'm not used to so much space. I, I can't see any houses. No houses is good. It means no people, no magicians. It makes me feel strange. It's so quiet. Well, what's one of the reasons it makes him feel strange, other than it being so quiet? There's something else that we've not been told, but that's clearly there. If there are no people, what else are there not any of? Magicians. Nathaniel's feeling all alone. He's never felt alone. You can't... You can rephrase this. I'm going to... Make two statements and then come back. You can't feel alone in London. Yes, metaphysically, you can have no friends and you can be totally alone and somebody can be standing right next to you. Okay? I can understand that kind of alienation. But you can't be alone in London. Everywhere you go, there are people all over. This, for the first time in his life, there's nobody. Okay? Made sense. He'd never been out of the city before now. Never even been in a big park. And there are several big parks in London. Hyde Park, Regent's Park, uh, St. James Park, etc. But there's always lots of people there too. But Nathaniel's never been even to one of those. Why not? Those are where commoners hang out. Okay? So...
They keep walking. They go past the village church, a village, a church, etc. They see a few see a few people. In page 354, Nathaniel says, Don't they realize how vulnerable they are? As we pass the final cottage, they've got no defenses. Any magical attack, and they'd be helpless. Bartimaeus. Perhaps that's not high on their list of priorities. There are other things to worry about. Making a living, for example. Right? Not that you'll have been taught anything about that. What does he mean by making a living? Does he mean going to work, having a job? Partially. What else does he mean? Why do you make a living? To live. Nathaniel doesn't have to worry about that. Why? He's a magician. He's been taken care of. But being a magician, everything's going to fall into place for him. Commoners, they have to eke out their living. Nathaniel, oh no? In response to, you'll not have been taught anything about that. To be a magician is the greatest calling. Our skills and sacrifices hold the country together. And those fools should be grateful we're there. You mean grateful for people like Loveless? And notice, no response. Why? Why doesn't Hatton Nathaniel have a response to that? I mean, Loveless is kind of the, the epitome of the magical society. He's risen to the top. If he's the model, what does that say about everything else beneath? Not very good. All right? So they keep talking, and Bartimaeus asks, as they get towards the hall, they can now see the building. And Bartimaeus says, bottom of 356, you see the dome? No. Your lenses are worse than useless. What do you expect? I don't have your sight, demon. Where is it? Coarse language. What coarse language? Demon. demon. I need to know this demon. Well, I don't like being called demon. Got that? Fine. Just so you know. All right. I'm a Ginny. Okay. Where's the dome? In the woods, six plane, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Why is this important to Bartimaeus? Other than, you know, I don't like being called pick your pejorative term. You know, for, for a demon, it's like a racist term, okay? What is Bartimaeus doing in emphasizing that to Nathaniel? Less like a magician. Trying to make him less like a magician, what else? In the magician's eyes, where is the demon, okay, compared to the magician? Down here, even though they're more powerful, even the marrieds, the things that don't have any name, they're down here. Why? Because they're not human. That's it. Right? Bartimaeus is trying to get Nathaniel to see, you know, equal footing. So, 359. The night comes, they have to spend the night out in the cold. Notice, has Nathaniel ever spent the night out in the cold? Well, he's had the night in the abandoned library, but Bartimaeus had made a fire there. And he tried to sleep, and all at once it struck me, my master would be suffering greatly from the cold. A pleasant hour passed. Notice, I realize Oh, the poor kid's probably suffering. And then an hour goes by. So it's like, he lets him go by suffering for an hour. Then another struck, thought struck me. He might actually freeze to death in his hiding place. Well, that would be because if he freezes to death, I'm off to old jokey. <coughs> so what does he do? He says, want some heat? Notice. Bartimaeus isn't doing that out of the quote-unquote kindness of his heart, because, one, first of all, he doesn't have heart. Literally, he doesn't have heart, okay? 
But two, he's not doing it for altruistic reasons. He's doing it solely so that he doesn't get imprisoned. Okay? So, I'm going to skip uh, a bunch. We find out gin and vehicles don't get along well. They see the produce guy coming in, grocery bringing stuff in. Um, they knock the driver and his son out. They get into the hall and we're told as they're bringing the stuff in, 375. They're taking the stuff into the kitchen. If you've ever been, if you've never been, um, to in England and been to one of these big old castle halls, estates, um, you know, they'll have ground floor, a huge kitchen. Sometimes the kitchen will kind of be the size of the footprint of the whole building because there will be several ovens. And I don't mean ovens like we have ovens. I mean ovens, I've actually seen some, where the oven is the size of that wall. You know, it's a big recessed fireplace, essentially. A walk-in fireplace, like you, you know, worked at a pizza place and you got a walk-in freezer. Well, this is a walk-in fireplace, right? Where you can have a flat cooking surface towards the back, you can have tripods for hanging stuff, boiling stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a big kitchen. And we're told, 375, someone says, you're late. The cook is need of your items. Please bring them to the kitchen with all speed. Yes, governor, Bartimaeus says. The cook. No, it couldn't be. Because who was a cook before? Simon Lovelace's. He'd be elsewhere, surely. Okay. And it turns out it is. Um... So Nathaniel gets in there, page 380, and we're told, bottom of the big paragraph in the middle, whatever happened, there would be no more helpless standing by while his enemies acted with impunity. He was taking control of events now. He was doing the hunting. He was closing in. Okay? Just before that, who have we been told they've seen? After the first shock of seeing the mercenary at the gate. Who's the mercenary? The, one that the, gu the guy who stole the amulet. Who wears seven league boots. You take a step and it's seven leagues. So you can go very long distances with very little effort very quickly. This guy figures in the next two books. He's one of the continuing characters. Sholto Penn's a continuing character. As we see here, Loveless gets his come up it's fairly quickly. Nathaniel's a continuing character. Katie's a continuing character, um, etc. So, they go on 384. Nathaniel's trying to figure out how to get into the actual hall stuff. So he's got um, he's knocked out a guy and, and taken his clothes to be kind of a serving person. And we're told so who's he speaking to? He sees Amanda Cathcart, Loveless's love interest. Notice by the way, Loveless is how love lace is pronounced. How much love does he really have for Amanda Cathcart? No, he's loveless to her. Okay, So, top of 384. The guilt that had beset him after the fire had now hardened into a cold acceptance of his situation. What's his situation? What does Bartimaeus mean by that? Well, Mrs. Underwood had died because he had stolen the amulet. That's part of the situation. She had died. Nathaniel had survived. So be it. In other words, you know, Hakuna Matata, that's in the past. He's still alive. Now he would destroy Loveless in his turn. He knew the likelihood was that he would not survive the day. This did not worry him. 
The odds were stacked in his enemy's favor. That was the way it should be. He would succeed or die trying. In other words, no holds barred anymore. A certain heroism in this equation appealed to him. Now, what did Loveless kind of attempt to teach him shortly before he was going to kill him? Are magicians heroic? No. They're cowards. They're bullies. It was clear and simple. It helped block out the messiness of his conscience. Well, the messiness of his conscience means it's my fault that Mrs. Underwood died. Because the messiness of that could do what to you? It could cause you to just melt in a puddle of tears. Okay? So no, it's the He's got he's to focus on, oh, I'm going to get him or I'm going to go down trying. Rather than, and I'm going to go down trying, and I'm going to cry, well, no, because I killed this is underwear. Kind of a thing. Let's see here. We find out that the magicians have bad manners from one of the servants, 386. Um, 387, we see Nathaniel watching Prime Minister Rupert Devereaux, who figures in the next two books, that he was showing his power to all of his assembled ministers. Okay. And Nathaniel's thinking, how can Loveless attempt to take on that? Um, skip a bit. Loveless leaves everybody, goes off through the corridors, and Nathaniel thinks, now's my chance. Now I'll get him. And he starts following him. 390. Loveless leads him into a room and tells this other person, I brought you a present, the boy. Nathaniel freezes, and he says, come, come, come around here to Maurice. Probably pr pronounced Morris, not Maurice. Maurice is an uh, American pronunciation. And stop trembling like an invalid. Another lesson for you, a magician never shows his fear. Notice, not a magician never fears. A magician never shows his fear. Okay? So, Loveless is thinking, you escaped once, you're going to die now. So who's Morris? Who's this old guy that Loveless has shown him to? His old master. Remember the story that Loveless told Nathaniel at Underwoods? How did Rupert Devereaux become prime minister? His old master killed the previous prime minister. Pretty clear, same kind of thing is at work. So, Nathaniel asks, how did you know I was here? Rufus Lyme recognized you. Okay. Who's Rufus Lyme? He was one of the people that was at Underwoods the year earlier when Nathaniel was humiliated. Okay. So, Shiler says, Rupert's arrived. He's arrived. Do you think he has, do you think he says, no. Normal paranoia sharpened by that cursed attack on Parliament. The resistance has a lot to answer for. Once in power, Simon, we must root them out, these stupid children, etc., etc. Okay? So, Shiler says, you're not fretting about the woman, are you? Well, who's the woman? His supposed girlfriend. Of course not. She's nothing to me. Everything set? Pentacle's ready, etc. What pentacle? Giant one in the room with what kind of floor? And what's gonna it's gonna get withdrawn and so 393. Shiler, because Loveless is left, Shiler says, I was for killing you straight away. This bottom of 392. But you know, he suggested we make you a proposition. What's the proposition? Join with me and together row the you know. Typical, right? So he keeps talking. You mentioned a proposition. You know, time's wasting. What's your what's your deal? In a few minutes, the hundred most powerful, eminent ministers in the government will be dead, 
along with our sainted Prime Minister. When Simon's new administration takes control, the lower magical orders will follow us unquestioningly since we'll be stronger than they. But we're not numerous. That is, we, we don't have enough people to fill out the government. There will be spaces, vacancies. We'll require talented magicians, great wealth, relaxations of power, await our allies. <coughs> now, relaxations of power can mean the relaxations you get from power, or it can mean we will unshackle your power. We will give you power you've never dreamed of. You've got moxie, kid. You've got ability, he says. Join us. We'll provide you with the apprenticeship you've always craved. And he has craved a proper apprenticeship, right? I mean, who would be the better master to teach him magic? Simon Loveless or Arthur Underwood? Loveless would take him places he'd never gone before. Okay? Six years of frustrated ambition were etched into his mind. Six years of suppressed desire to be recognized for what he was. Okay, six years. He's 12 now, so when he was six, he thought, I'm somebody. Okay, this is an arrogant little SOB, okay? To exercise his power openly, to go to Parliament as a great minister of state, and now his enemies were offering it all to him. You're tempted, John. Well, what do you... I mean, again, this is like the emperor going, yes, I can feel the power. You know. Does Simon Loveless really think I will join him? He does. After everything that's happened. Yep. What does Nathaniel mean after everything that has happened? After killing Mrs. Underwood? Yep. He knows how your mind works. Does he? Yes. yes, he does. <laughs> Even though Nathaniel says, well, he's a fool. Why? What does Lo Loveless not understand about Nathaniel? Cared for somebody. He underestimated that sense of honor that Nathaniel has. It's not a full-blown sense of honor. It's a little kind of germ seed of honor. But it has germinated. It is growing very, very slowly and stuntedly. He is an arrogant fool. After what he's done, notice, not to Martha, to me, he spanked me till I was unconscious, you know. He could offer up the world and I'd refuse it. Now, there's a biblical parallel or a biblical illusion. What does it gain a man to gain the world but lose his soul? John's not talking about his soul, but Stroud, the author, is. He could offer me the world. What other biblical illusion? Christ goes off in the desert for 40 days, 40 nights, and what happens? The devil comes to him and tempts him three times. And the third and final attempt is what? You can have everything. No. You have not been brought up correctly. Your mind is fogged. What does he mean, fogged? You don't see clearly. Why? Because if you saw clearly, what would you see? What are we told at the end of the first Harry Potter novel? There is only power. That's it. If you saw there was only power, you would jump at this opportunity. Okay, and what's the implication of that? If he jumped at this opportunity, and he was taught by Simon Loveless, what would Nathaniel, the apprentice, this is, this is, you know, in almost every mythological story, what would Nathaniel, the apprentice, eventually do? Kill his master. What does Darth Vader do to Obi-Wan? Kills his master. All right? I was impressed the first time we met. So young, so full of knowledge. I thought Simon was very harsh on you. 
I know he shouldn't have beaten you. Even the affair with the mites was amusing, displayed an enterprising nature. In other words, I sat there and thought, way to go, kid. This is good. Ordinarily, I'd kill you slowly, but no. So, Nathaniel gets away, kills Skyler, okay, and we get Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus sees the summoning horn. I'm going to skip a bunch. The man in black comes in. Bartimaeus gets him away. And we go back to Nathaniel. And let's see here. Page 411. Bartimaeus helps rescue him. Says, so you made your first kill. How's it feel? Feel good? Much more manly, I'm sure. Does it help blot out the death of Underwood's wife? In other words, okay, so Martha Underwood over here, you're responsible for. So you kill Scarlet, the guy who's responsible for Simon Loveless. So it kind of cancels it out, makes makes everything even. Your your conscience is clear now? No. So they go into the big conference hall room. And Bartimaeus says, 419, well, whatever he's going to do, it can't be too powerful. Loveless would have to use a pentacle. Amulet's it's all very well for personal protection, blah, 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 blah. And what happens? The carpet gets pulled back. Okay. And I'm going to skip a bunch again. Um, Loveless uses the summoning horn the distortion of the planes begins and the thing from the other place comes in and 429 bottom of 428 Nathaniel asks what is it 429 I don't know exactly judging by its caution and coming through it's rarely been summoned before probably surprised and angry but its strength is clear enough why would it be surprised and angry not the surprise as much, but the anger. What happens to a spirit when it comes from the other place to this place? It takes on physical form. What else? It's confined. And the confinement is what for the spirit? Pain. It's not just uncomfortable. It's pain. Okay? In the other place, it doesn't experience pain at all. It just is, okay? Look around inside the pentacle. Magic is going wrong. Things are beginning to change form. All normal laws are being warped, suspended. The greatest of us always bring the chaos of the other place with the Notice, the greatest of us. Kind of, I'm like this thing. Not quite. No wonder Loveless needed the amulet. The amulet, remember, will protect him against anything. So as long as he's wearing it, or as long as whoever is wearing it, this thing cannot hurt that person. Okay? So Bartimaeus says, Loveless had to have help, etc., etc. Nathaniel, how can we get out? If we escape, what must we do? I'll tell you, we need to accomplish two things, bottom of 430. Get the amulet off Loveless. That's your job. Why? Because I, Bartimaeus, can't touch the amulet now that he's wearing it. Why? It protects him against things like us. So, you've got to get it. Why? Because Nathaniel's not magical. He's a magician, but he can't do magic, per se, on his own. What's the second thing? We must reverse the summons to drive our big friend away. That's your job. He's like, what? My, I've got to get the amulet, and I've got to send, you know, big friend away. Yes, I'll help you. I'll steal the summoning horn. Needs to be broken if we're going to do the job. Do you know the dismissal spell? Some of the stronger ones are bound to know enough, providing they're still conscious. That is some of the other um, things. So...
there's a whole bunch I've got underlined, but yeah, let's pick up there. Um, 432, we find out the other thing's name, Ramuthra, and Loveless gives it a command. Every other living thing in this room, be it human or spirit, is yours. Destroy them. Now, the girlfriend is sitting over there going, what gives? Fly makes an aggressive dart at Loveless's face. The fly is Bartimaeus. When he does, Nathaniel pounces. As he did so, the fly became a marmoset, snatched at the horn with clever, greedy fingers. Loveless cried out, gave the marmoset a buffet that sent it spinning. Bending his back, he tossed Nathaniel over his head. He says, so you rejected my offer. How did you elude Morris with the help of this thing? That's part of Mace, et cetera, et cetera. And a hulking shape materializes. It's Jabor, who does figure in the next two also, as do next one. I think Jabor meets his match in the next book. Loveless goes on, 434. You know, John, if you'd had the luck to be apprenticed to me from the start, we might have done great things together. I recognize something in you. What is it he recognizes in him? Me. I look at you, and I see me at your age. You're a mirror of my younger days. We share the same will to power. Anybody know who came up with that phrase? It's not original to Jonathan Stroud. German philosopher. I'm going to spell it wrong. Friedrich Nietzsche. Is that right? German philosopher, 1844 to 1900, okay? The father of what has become known as nihilism. What is nihilism? It's essentially the philosophy that there is no meaning. None. There is no meaning to life. You're born, you die, that's it. Any meaning you ascribe to life is entirely false. Okay? He died of, um, what's the word I want? Drawing a blank? Insanity. You're crazy. Now, some people say, oh, yeah, if that's your mentality, then, yeah, you are going to go crazy. Okay? But he came up with this notion of will to power. Nietzsche said Christianity is a weak religion. Why? What does Christianity preach? What did Jesus preach? Things like forgiveness. Forgiveness? Humbleness. Hum humility? Turn, you know, somebody smacks you, turn the other cheek. Okay? Slave mentality. Yeah, Nietzsche said... Well, that's a way to get your ass kicked. Don't do that. Do the opposite. He's also the one who came up with the phrase, God is dead. Why? We killed him. How? Not like Philip Pullman does in his silly little novels, his Dark Material series. We killed him because we outgrew the need for him, Nietzsche said. Kind of interesting, who's a big follower of Friedrich Nietzsche? Anybody know? A. H. Adolf Hitler loved Nietzsche. So, power, it's all there is. But you were corrupted by Underwood softness. No, he wasn't corrupted by Underwood softness. He had a I don't know what you want to call it, a spark of goodness in him. So, he says, even now you haven't given up. What does he mean, even now? Look at our big friend. In the face of total defeat, you don't give up. What's loveless mean? The smart person would beg mercy, right? Of course, Loveless being the unmerciful person he is, would not give it. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's your iron wheel in action. It's good. Man, if you'd been my apprentice, I'd have trained you, etc. Okay? If he is to survive, a true patient, a true magician must be patient. Nathaniel. Yeah, I've been told that before. Yeah, but by whom? His art teacher, Ms. Luchens. Okay? So... 
Jabor and Bartimaeus go back and forth. Bartimaeus, um, oh, that's right, it's here that Jabor gets his comeuppance. Jabor gets sucked away by the Ramuthra. And we hear Loveless continue talking to um, Nathaniel about Ramuthra and about the what the amulet does, etc., etc. Amanda says, you know, Simon, what about me? He says, I'm sorry, it had to be, 441. No, Simon, you promised me so much. Sideways on, Nathaniel stole closer. Get away from me, woman, or I'll call on the demon. How could you use me in this way, Simon? You have no... Well, of course he has no honor. What should that be to Loveless? Her saying, you have no honor. Louder? Okay. What else, though? I mean, yeah, I can understand that. What does Loveless say about honor earlier? Magicians don't have any. This should be the indication to him. Maybe this isn't really Amanda Cathcart. Because Amanda Cathcart, being a magician of the kind of Loveless, wouldn't talk about honor. Okay? So... Nathaniel leaps forward, he snatches, he gets the amulet, he pulls, and the chain breaks. And what do we discover? It was Bartimaeus. Okay. A smile of triumphant wickedness spread across her face from ear to ear, page 443. Then in a flash, one of her lovely arms snaked out, plucking the summoning horn from Loveless's slackening grip. And with a bound, Amanda Cathcart was gone, and two down, one to go. <coughs> so, then I skip a bunch. Now we have a bunch of people yelling to him, 446, and 447. Now Nathaniel has got to do what? He's got to do the banishing, the dismissing charm. Only this isn't just the regular dismissal charm, okay? And we're told, 447, just about the middle of the page, peace, Nathaniel. Why? Or, excuse me, patience, Nathaniel. Patience. What's the patience, Nathaniel, in italics mean? This is his thought. Why is he thinking patience? Okay, got a lot going on. What else? What happens if he screws it up? Everyone dies. Okay? So, patience means... <laughs> Gather your composure. Enter that, you know, that, that pretty place. If you've ever done meditation, he breathes slowly. Why? He's slowing down his heart rate. He's getting control. Because he has to remember this spell perfectly. And across the great gulf came the remembered piece of his master's garden. He saw the rhododendron bushes. He saw the apple trees. He saw the cat. He saw, imagine, Mrs. Luchin's sketching, his mind cleared, his memory blossomed, he opened his eyes and spoke the words. As the ivory cracked and the words rang out, Ramuthra stopped dead. The shimmering ripples in the air that defined its outlines quivered and whoop, it goes back. In utter silence, Nathaniel crossed where Rupert, bottom of 448, Devereux sprawled half buried under the foreign minister and placed the amulet in. Is Nathaniel in a, a state of safety here? No. Are any of them? No. I mean, Rupert Devereaux, we're told, is a fairly powerful magician. He could call up things now that, you know, big friend is gone. And what does Nathaniel do? He takes his one total means of perfection and drops it in his hand. Why? the right thing to do? Look, look at Bartimaeus. Typical of the kid that was. What does Bartimaeus mean? He's not thinking of the future. He carried out the most important act of his grubby little life. You'd expect him to sink to the ground in exhaustion and relief, but no, no. This was his big chance, and he seized it in the most theatrical fashion possible. 
He's saying, this kid's trying to make a statement. With all eyes on him. Notice, he hobbled like he's been wounded in the leg. Right? Hobbled across the ruined auditorium like a wounded bird, frail as you like, straight for the center of power. What was he going to do? No one knew. That is, all eyes are on him. They see him going towards Rupert Devereux. Is he going to kill him? Did he maybe act? No. Joined up with Loveless and, like all the other masters, took on his master. And then, in the climactic moment of this little charade, all was revealed. The legendary amulet of Samarkand and the kid even remembered to bow his head. Why? What's the bow mean? Deference to your majesty. What a performance. In fact, almost more than his ability to bully Jim, the ins this instinct of pandering to the crowd suggested to me that the boy was probably destined for worldly success. Okay. This is Bartimaeus' thoughts. Why? His thoughts are predicated upon how many years of human history? 5,000. He has seen magicians come and go over 5,000 years. And this is what they typically do. Okay. What's he not correctly reading? He sees Nathaniel doing this all as what? A big show. Is Nathaniel doing it all as a big show? No, he's not. Okay? So, he tells about how his master had long been suspicious, how he died. That, okay? So we're going to jump to the very end in the last few minutes. Um, he gets placed in the keeping of Jessica Whitwell, who's the chief of the secret police kind of a thing. Um, Four fifty-nine. Right? Bartimaeus is trying to talk him into letting him go, sending him back. He's like, I, I can't do that. He says, how about if I make a vow? He goes, you're deep. Sorry, Ginny, vows mean nothing. No, you're confusing me with a magician. With magicians, vows mean nothing. How about this? If you don't dismiss me here and now, I'll go right downstairs, tell your dear Miss Whitwell exactly what's been going on. I could, yeah, you could do lots of things. That's your trouble. You're too clever for your own good. A lot has happened because you're too clever to let things lie. You wanted revenge. You so, in other words, all this happened because of you. Bartimaeus kind of gets that. Dismiss me, John. I've done enough. I'm tired. And so are you. Why does he call him John? Okay. 461. For a magician, you've got potential. I don't mean the way you think I mean. Okay, notice. You've got potential. I don't mean the way you think I mean. What does he think Nathaniel understands by that? Oh, you can have power. What does he mean you have potential? You could be a decent human being. You could be an honorable person. You've got far more initiative than most of them. You'll crush it out of you if you're not careful. You've got a conscience. Another thing, rare, easily lost, guard it. Oh, and I'd beware of you, new master. John. Oh, you don't need to worry about me. So why is he calling John and not Nathaniel? I'm not really trying to remind him of the fact that he knows his true name. Okay. Possibly. What else? Is he being polite? How about for Bartimaeus? Nathaniel's kind of dead and buried. That is, John Mandrake, the savior of parliament, the savior of the government, has now risen and taken Nathaniel's place. Because Nathaniel was what? Keep going. Who had what kind of ideas? Honor, nobility, at least according to Lovelace, it was because of his honor, his inherent honor, his nobility, that he attempted to do what? 
take the blame. Now, what's happened? Bartimaeus, we didn't talk about it, but Bartimaeus talked about the newspaper clippings. What's going on with John's mind, or Nathaniel's mind? That ego is just being stroked. And it's like a little flame, and the bellows is just building that flame up. Right? If you read the next book, which I strongly encourage you, you're almost not going to recognize John Mandrake. All right, we'll stop there. Don't forget your exam due Monday, 10 o'clock, okay? It's been emailed to you.